We are continuing our series of the interviews with innovation book authors, and today we are talking to Andy Benz, co-author of the book Corporate Explorer, How Corporations Beat Startups at the Innovation Game, together with Charles O'Reilly and Michael Tishman. Andy has 25 years of advisory experience, having worked as an external and internal consultant for McKinsey, the IBM Corporation, and ChangeLogic. And uh, Andrew, thanks so much for uh, joining us today and uh, chatting with us. Great. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Our pleasure. So to kind of dive into things, uh, the first question that I have is, can you tell me a bit about yourself and the journey that led you to the co-writing of the Corporate Explorer book and really what inspired you to write it? Yeah, I mean, for, from for, <laughs> from many perspectives, that this book is is crazy. I mean, it's Corporate Explorers, how corporations beat startups at the innovation game. Uh, and this leads many to to doubt our sanity. How could we say something so heretical uh, as that corporations beat startups? And and you know to some degree that thought is is you know is is really tough. There's no question it's hard. And I know from when I worked at uh, at IBM uh, for a number of years on what we called the emerging business opportunities, we faced obstacle after obstacle, um, unintended. Um, deliberate, uh, deliberate, accidental, all kinds of different things that a large corporation puts up in front of small innovations that at first are completely unproven, uncertain, uh, and so on. And so, you know, this impetus for talking about corporate explorers comes from experience, but it comes from the reality that there are success cases and they don't get enough attention. Right. And so mm-hmm. what Corporate Explorers um, does is it, it it tells some of those success stories, what they do, how they do it. How do we explain the differences between those that succeed from the many uh, that struggle and will fail? Yeah, no, 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 fascinating. And so at least from what we have seen with our clients and our partners is that, uh, you know, startups, they really do have a competitive advantage in many different ways. But really, what are some of the ways to where corporates are able to, uh, you know, strengthen their their hand at play and to defend their space and to really ultimately compete and win? Yeah, so so it's interesting to talk about startups having competitive advantage. I mean, most of the data about that is to do with the early stages of startups, how they ideate and incubate their businesses, but not necessarily how they scale. The vast majority, the vast majority of startups scale by getting acquired by corporates, right? And so if you think about innovation as ideation, incubation, and scaling, in other words, turning an idea into revenue, into impact, really speaking, uh, corporates are the most likely route, not the only route. A number of startups, of course, scale to um, be uh, fully-fledged businesses. And when we think about those that have the most impact, yes, those are startups, most certainly, um, the Googles, Amazons, and, and so on of the world. But that story masks another reality. And the other reality is that when you look at Microsoft, um, uh, NEC in, uh, in Japan, uh, Bosch with e-bikes in, uh, in Germany, uh, LexisNexis, a firm you know, not many of us necessarily know a lot about, but creating a multi-billion dollar business. There are real examples of multi-billion dollar businesses being created from inside existing corporations. And the reason they don't get attention is it's just not as sexy. They're not a unicorn with a fabulous market valuation. They're like, oh yeah, another corporation creates another business, right? And so we skate over them and our ability to discern the data that is there right in front of us is kind of limited. Uh, and so we miss it, even though they're hiding in plain sight. And so the the the, the key thing about uh, about this is that it ref- reflects, you know, real empirical reality. And the thing that 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 a corporation has over a startup is assets, actual customers, revenues, products, capabilities that a startup struggles to find. And so the question is, how does a corporation leverage those assets? And of course, that is also the place where they often struggle. So the question is, how do you make that work uh, in a way that enables to allow them to go faster? And, And really, that's the story of the corporate explorer, being able to both do the job 
of the startup ideating, incubating um, uh, uh, the assets that they need to build, but then also leveraging the assets of the core business and where are needing acquiring uh, those assets to build out uh, a scaled business. Yeah, very well said. Um, so you mentioned uh, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Bosch, yeah. and you know I can imagine that there's some similarity or at least some kind of common thread or trend that they do that allows them to be successful. Is there something that you noticed in your experience in working with these organizations or from the research that you have found? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I want to say two things about that. The first thing is I think it's a flaw of of business research and certainly of management consulting um, to take a few data points and infer a recipe, right? So I'm not offering a recipe. The, the understand I'm offering stories, lessons, insights that you can learn from and extract from. But 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 you ask, and I think you're right to ask that you know what 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 are some of those key differentiators? And I'll tell you, one of them really stands out, and that is ambition. Mm -hmm. Do you have a scale of ambition that is equal to the threat or the opportunity of disruption? Because in a corporation, if your scale of ambition is really low, like I think if I come up with this idea, I might be able to get um, support from my manager to do a little bit of funding um, to you know, get slightly better in our product category or penetrate a few more customers, then that's all you'll do. It'll be that incremental change in your business. If, however, you say, I see an opportunity to create a big data analytics business as Lexus, as Jim Peck did at LexisNexis and said, hey, I could actually scale this to multi-billion dollar entity. That's a completely different scale of ambition. And it sets you mm -hmm. down a path in terms of the kinds of decisions you make that is entirely different as well. Yeah, and if you look, another sense. great high ambition company is Jensen Huang at NVIDIA, the um, what was simply a gaming company, you know, making um, uh, graphic processing units really highly praised by gamers. I knew about them because my son was a, uh, a you know, avid gamer. Um, and yet what they found around 2010 was that they were going to lose their market to Intel. Right, Intel just going to swallow them up um, uh, uh, into their processing unit, and and Jensen Huang said no. He said we're going to have an ambition to take visual computing and make it a platform for um, artificial intelligence, for autonomous driving, for scientific discovery. And he deliberately, uh, you know, you can go back and look at his investor charts. He he clearly sets out this strategy to say I'm going to go after these five different end markets and he loses in some, but he wins in others. And as a result, at one point, his share price was up 8000 percent inside of three years. Right. So this is an astonishing 25 year old company that does exactly what we're describing. But, you know, and in some ways that did make headlines because it is an astonishing result. But I think it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, still not sufficiently heralded or understood. Yeah, and so I think one of the the key messages from that last comment that you made, it's really about the idea of ambition itself. Are there any steps that you would recommend an organization to take to help define that North Star, if you will, but really try and make an ambition an ambition tangible? Yeah, it's so, totally. You know, part of the question of ambition is um, it, it, it sits at different levels, right? So if you're a CEO or you're a, a business unit manager, or you're on a senior team, then you have a different set of things that you need to do than if you're um, a, a manager a few levels down trying to advocate for and agitate for um, um uh, for for a, an innovation project, um, and and uh, th that's just the reality of things. If you're in the senior team, or if you've got influence to the senior team, then you know the key question is: What do you want to be famous for? What impact are you going to have on the world? And people get wrapped around the corporate language of vision and mission. Just kind of put that mm -hmm. to one side. This is about you know what are you really going to achieve? What 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 do you want to uh, um, uh, achieve? So so an example of this is Ajay Banga at Mastercard, and he sets an ambition uh, for his company in like uh, 2012 2013. He says, um, I, I want to wage a war on cash, right? So wage a war on cash is like emotive, right? So emotional 
um, is really important in, in an ambition. Then he says, and I want to do it by converting a high percentage of the 85% of transactions that are currently cash into digital. What he just did is he added a, a, a measurable aspiration to the whole thing so they kind of know what success looks like. And then he says, I'm going to do it by uh, by developing you know, new digital um, uh, payment uh, businesses. Um, and, and that's then the logical connection to his existing business. Because when he starts, mm -hmm. MasterCard is simply credit card processing, which is actually a really small subsector of, uh, of, 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 of the payments industry. And he expands with this wage of war on cash, give, makes it emotive, gives some aspirational goals, and then also makes it logical in terms of how it connects to the existing strategy. So that's really what ambition is all about if you're in the senior team level. If you're trying to influence the senior team from lower down, then to some degree, you've got to help them see the opportunities in their own strategies, right? And find places where of what they want to realize and help them connect the dots. We often do this by um, uh, helping a senior team to draft what we call a strategy manifesto, right? A, a really simple distillation of what it is they want to get done and why. Um, and that creates sort of a license to the corporate explorers in the organization so that they will step forward with ways of realizing that ambition. Yeah. And so that kind of links back to a bit of the, 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 the trust side of things and really getting stakeholder buy-in outside of that innovation or uh, investor manifesto. Um, are there any other steps that you would really recommend somebody to take for kind of the profile that is looking to push an innovation initiative and really trying to disrupt the culture of, you know, traditionalism and really trying to just really bring innovation in house? How would you recommend uh, going beyond this framework to actually build the trust and get the buy-in? And more importantly, I would say the mandate from their stakeholders. Yeah. So, so Tom, I think this is the, the sort of the, the really the crux of the issue, right? Um, because senior managers, senior stakeholders, they're, they're, this is the investor base. You know, if you're a startup CEO, you spend, you know, more than 50% of your time on funding rounds, right? And this is this is the same for a corporate explorer. It's exactly the it same. Is. It's just the nature of who you've got to engage with and what you've got to unlock with them is different. And 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 the and the relationship you have is is sometimes less formally structured, so it can be can be harder harder to do. Let me let me give you an example of somebody who um, who did this really well, and then sort of extract the lessons from that because um, th th there are a bunch of people who've done this well. One one of them is is um, Christian Kurtisch at the uh, Austrian uh, um, uh, insurance company Unica. And Unica is like a 200 year old uh, insurance company. Everybody's archetype for old and slow and hierarchical and all the rest of it. Uh, when our story starts, I'm not commenting on it now. Um, and uh, and down the Danube in Budapest is Christian Kurtisch. And Christian is there running this relatively small business in Hungary. And he says, you know, I am frustrated with uh, the insurance industry and I and, and I see that it's lost its core. It's lost its reason to exist. It used to be about risk sharing communities, people coming together to cover one another um, at times of hardship. And, but it's become all about administering policies and catching our customers out at fraud, right? Rather than at actually, you know, the, the core thing that it, it, it always used to be. And so he builds this business idea called share risk. He says, well, what would Spotify do? Um, and and he engages his senior team, firstly, people close to him in the management hierarchy with this ambition. He shares this insight. And after many conversations, he gets the right to go and present to the CEO and says, look, this is the problem we face. And he's very dramatic in his imagery. He has this this chart on one side of the chart is a, a tower block with and he and he puts in the percentage costs of all of the different layers of administration that exists in the business. And oh, his his graphic just looks a little bit like the Unica Tower uh, in Vienna, right? Just just a little subtext for it. And on the other side, he's got the two people he think it'll take to administer share risk, right, as a business. And he says this is a this is a dramatically different world. And you know we've got an option as to what we can do. So what he does with this is 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 and 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 I should say he gets permission to get started, right? 
to to earn a little bit of money uh, in 2017 to kind of prove out the the fundamentals uh, of his case, and then he progresses through a series of six monthly milestones to get more and more um, trust uh, in in the in in the business. A few things that he does in this. Firstly, um, he comes with a customer problem. Right, it's really clear what um, he wants to solve, and he doesn't claim that he has like the greatest idea in the world. This is one of the mistakes that corporate explorers make is they get attached to their own idea rather than get attached to the customer problem that they're solving. Because the thing is, if you attach yourself to the customer problem, two things happen. Firstly, um, it becomes clear to everyone that that's something other people can solve too, right? So the, the threat becomes more real for you. Secondly, yeah. you're also positioning yourself uh, as learning rather than just trying to drive your own agenda. Right. And this is then the second piece I want to say is about how do you demonstrate accountability? One of the great myths for corporate innovations is that we they should be just set free, set they should be let loose to do whatever they need to do, right? Um, and instead of that they should just be held accountable in a different way. Right. Of course, they shouldn't be accountable for profit and revenue and traditional business outcomes, but they can be um, uh, held accountable in terms of the milestones that they accomplish, the learnings that they uh, achieve and so on. And so they've got to have this different um, uh, way of being held accountable. And Christian teaches his CEO what holding him accountable looks like by only going six months at, at a time through the process. Yeah. Um, and then and then the last one is is transparency that when you hit uh, a road bump you're willing to say this hasn't worked uh, we've got a problem and um, one of the most common uh, uh, points at which a corporate explorer fails is when um, they cover up uh, uh, a problem that it turns out the route to market they thought was going to work doesn't, or it turns out that customers aren't adopting at the rate that they anticipated. And they kind of smudge it in the quarterly you know, debrief with their stakeholders. And then down the road, somebody finds out and they might understand the explanation. But next time they go, well, you've got another slip. Is this is this because you're telling me the truth or or is this actually um, uh, you covering it up? And it destabilizes the conversation about performance, right? And yeah. so this is really, and this is counter to a lot of um, evidence and experience and, and business school professors thinking about how managers should behave, that they should tell a great story, a complete story, that they should always be the one with the answer, not the, not the problem. Uh, and so that's a real challenge for how you do it. And one of the assets that, that, you, that you find one of the common threads you find with these corporate explorers like Christian is is their relative humidity humility. They don't strut the halls showing how great they are. They let others feel that they made them successful. There's a dozen people uh, in Unica that think they have helped Christian Curtis get to the point where now share risk has scaled across nine countries. Right. Um, and and that, you know, that the, the, they were the ones who did this. Right. But, you know, he 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 doesn't need to be the hero in this story. And that's a bit of a contrast with many entrepreneurs, to be perfectly honest, as well. So, you know, I, I tell you one other thing that runs counter to, to, to common view is that the people who succeed are long term insiders. They have a social network. They're already yeah. trusted. Right. And this kind of fad for bringing entrepreneurs and residents in or hiring people from the outside. There's no data to suggest that this works. Um, it's it's and, it, and it's counter to most of the evidence we have about successful corporate innovation. And uh, for those individuals who are the corporate explorers who have been a part of the organization for 25 years, I imagine there's maybe a couple of characteristics that make them stand out and make them an ideal kind of corporate explorer to bring something forward. Is there something um, that you would recommend a um, an innovation manager or somebody in the C-suite to, you know, what's a characteristic of yeah. their profile or their personality that stands out? Yeah, I think I think there, there, there are a few. The first one is this obsession about a customer problem, right? Whether it's Christian Curtis at Unica or it's Jim Peck at LexisNexis or Balaji Bondilli uh, at, at Deloitte. Um, they they all have some personal experience that drives them to say, hey, that's something in the world. Like for, for Balaji, 
he gets involved in the um, um, the uh, Asian tsunami on you know what the English call Boxing Day tsunami in in, in uh, uh, I forget when that was like 15 years ago, and he gets involved in a crowd um, organized response to providing aid to the victims of the tsunami. And when he's sitting there thinking, geez, I'm tired of consulting um, and I wish I didn't have to get on the road every week to go consult to my clients. He thinks about, hey, maybe I could bring crowds to consulting. And he develops this thing called Deloitte Pixel, where they bring crowdsourced expertise to clients um, uh, through things like Expertify and other other things. So it's that personal experience, that problem that they can see in the world and that, how could they make it happen um, uh, in that way. That's one that's big. The second one is the humility point that they don't need to, to know uh, everything. And that helps them then with the third, which is they have or build social capital. Right. The thing that enables you to succeed with your investor base in a corporation is that you have social capital connections, people who will help you, people who will be your advocates, your ambassadors to, um, to sponsors that you need, people who help you solve problems and so on. That social capital is, is a critical um, um, uh, 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 issue. Uh, and, and, and then uh, finally, I think they're, they're, they are probably mavericks. There is something uh, a little maverick about them. Uh, I the first corporate explorer I worked with was back in 2001 uh, was uh, Carol Kovac at um, IBM and Carol um, built a multi-billion dollar business for IBM in, in life sciences and um, but Carol was always a little bit of an oddity um, she was always sort of causing problems for people and was was you know was the one who would speak up that will often be your corporate explorer. So you need to, because they're, they're always running against the tide. That's kind of deliberately the point. You want to keep your current business being strongly operationally efficient and optimized and cash generating. And then you're going to have a you're going to have somebody swimming in the other direction who's exploring, who's who's experimenting, who's learning. And and necessarily that's a diff, that that takes a character who's willing to be different to the rest. Um, yeah, it's quite the profile, especially if somebody has all three of those characteristics. Um, so you mentioned a bit earlier, uh, kind of this idea of ideation, incubation, and yeah. scaling. And um, you also mentioned that I believe in one of your first examples you told me today, that it's so important that somebody who is looking to gain the trust of their senior management is not only transparent, but they help educate them on how they need to be measured. And so you know that benchmarking is yeah. extremely important. So a bit of a two part question. Number one, what is ideation, incubation and scaling? Why, why did you kind yes. of pinpoint these three segments? And then yes. secondary uh, follow up is what are the milestones or probably the key benchmarks at all three phases? If you could uh, kind of enlighten us a little bit, because it's one of our biggest questions that we get. It's what are the metrics that we should be looking at uh, from our clients and our partners? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, ideation, incubation, and scaling. You know, we describe as the three sort of disciplines of uh, of innovation. And um, ideation is all about you know really really two things. Firstly, generating a set of um, um, uh, you know uh, possible customer problems to solve. So we talk about having clear hunting zones, areas where you think that there is opportunity um, that will enable you to realize your ambition. And then what are the customer problems in that? So if you're, for instance, we worked with um, uh, with a, an insurance company on how do they develop a healthcare business? So, you know, their hunting zones turned out to be mental health, elderly care, um, and um, and another one, I can't remember. So it's kind of a set of different areas. And then once you have your customer problems and you understand them, then you can do the job of ideation of how do you get a wide array of different possibilities, right? Um, and that that is the place for a little bit of um, a number of ideas. So in, in that, you know, your metrics are, you know, how many customer problems do, do I have, right, that I could solve? Um, and, and then some sense as to what are the uh, different ideas. Incubation is all about, um, is about choosing just a few of those to do. 
um, not too many. Otherwise, you end up in this sort of zoo situation where you have m more things that you can do than you can possibly fund or resource. Um, and that's one of my big criticisms of many uh, innovation programs is just that they're, they're doing far too much. And it's more about you know, creating excitement and noise than it is about actually delivering uh, a scale to business. Um, and that, I think that's a real trap for corporations. Um, and so incubation is all about this sort of careful work of experimentation. And here it's about, do you know the, the critical assumptions upon which the business is based and have you validated or refuted them? And so the sort of you're, you're looking then at some sense of pipeline metrics, you know, how many open um, uh, uh, assumptions do we have? Um, how many uh, validated ones do we have and so on? Because the tendency is to make experimentation uh, all about proving what you already think. And that is not learning, that is not innovation. Right, it's not an experiment. So you've got to be thinking about, OK, uh, constantly um, th thinking about how many have I validated, how many are still open, how many have I refuted and kind of uh, work working through in, in that measure. And, and then scaling is is about um, you know, rates of customer adoption, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, throughput metrics about, you know, have I got uh, channel capacity as forecast um, and, 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 and reach uh, audience reach and advertising or whatever it might be. So, you, you know, they're idiosyncratic to, to, to the scaling phase, but scaling where the action is, right? Incubation is hard, um, but uh, and ideation uh, is, uh, it, it, I don't think ideation is actually as, as hard. I think it's a relatively knowable. It's, there's no risk, right, in ideation. Uh, the risk really mm -hmm. is at the moment when you move from incubation to scaling. That's when you actually commit resources to this. And that's the toughest part in all of this story. Uh, and so here it's about understanding, you know, what are those assumptions that you need to prove in order to move the business forward and knowing the difference between a one way and a two way door. Right. Uh, the one way door is irrevocable. The two way door you can come in and out of. But there is a few big one way doors about the degree to which, you know, you've really committed yourself um, and, and, and to focusing attention are, are really around those. Yeah, very, very well said, very insightful. And so we covered a bit about gaining trust uh, from your stakeholders. We covered the importance of having an amb ambition. We covered the three different segments of uh, incubation, uh, ideation and scaling. And so this kind of encompasses a bit of what it means to have a successful corporate innovation strategy. Um, but what are some of the watchouts that uh, organizations and corporates should be wary of when it comes to creating their own uh, internal as well as external innovation strategy? Yeah, I think that um, for, for, for me, the key watch outs uh, really come in um, in two, two key buckets, if you will. Um, the first one is uh, about uh, activity or outcomes. Like, what are you actually trying to do here? Are you trying to create a lot of um, um, things that look like innovation or are you trying to actually do innovation because most uh, 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 and apologies to anyone listening who i might offend most corporate innovation units i come across are more focused around activity they're focused on you know l lots of show of start you know engagement with startups idea competitions uh, exploration activities, venture cap, you know, these, you know, um, venture cap connections, ecosystem stuff, you know, um, this is great, but it's all about outcomes. How many scaled businesses have you created? What capabilities have you built that then, you know, generate revenue? And I think that um, most of what we see in the research is that those outcomes are not led by innovation labs, entrepreneurs in residence, or any of the things that you know get attention in the innovation community. They're led by corporate explorers with an idea who win a sponsor, who get backing and they drive it. And that's true for my uh, Christian Kurdish example of share risk, it's true of e-bikes, it's true of the IBM, it, it's true in all of these examples. And no doubt there are examples that I don't know that, that, that you know, that are counterfactual to, to what I'm saying. But 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 my view is you've got to know the difference between activity and outcome. The second thing I think is really important is that the innovation in corporations is, yes, about ideation, incubation and scaling, managing the innovation process. But it's also about change. 
it's always about change always and so this question of social capital the question of how do you move key stakeholders towards you how do you understand what they need um, to be successful how do you build a coalition of people around you um you know my my colleague from harvard mike tushman has uh, just done a case um, on uh, nl the italian energy company and they did this spectacularly well right or he did this case on deloitte pixel Balaji Bondilli, more from the, the bottom up than the top down, does this successfully well. So it can be done, right? It's not the case that um, managers in corporations are incapable of building the support around them to get an outcome, right? And, and oh, by the way, one of the great myths we have is that all you need is CEO support. If you have CEO support, everything suddenly comes open. That isn't true of John Windsor at Havas, the French advertising company. John's brought in to lead innovation. Great CEO support, gets absolutely killed. GE, uh, GE Digital and, and their Predix platform, Bill Rue comes in from Cisco to lead that with board support, Jet Firmal, the CEO at the time, all over it. You know, strategy still survives, but the unit defunded, Imalt's gone, Rue's gone, etc. So having the CEO support is not the whole story by any means. It's about how well do you neutralize what I call the silent killers in the organization? And mostly those are the assumptions of the past business model, right? These are things that are always there, but they're just kind of lazy assumptions that people have. And you need to work hard to identify and neutralize those rather than just to sort of hope that it'll all sort out and the quality of your idea will somehow triumph. Unless you manage change, it won't. Wonderful. And so uh, my last question uh, for today, it's uh, some could say we're living in a bit of uncertain times. There's a lot of crazy things that are happening in the world. We're seeing a bit of inflation, interest rates are increasing, and there's even talks of a potential recession. But in today's context, in today's climate, how do you see this impacting corporate innovation? And what would you tell corporates that might be looking to actually turn inwards rather than looking to innovate and look to the future to achieve an ambition? Well, right. corporations are going to respond to this situation by, you know, cutting back, optimizing operations, preserving cash, driving profits. That's just the way it is. However, at some point they're going to say, oh, where's our next source of growth coming from? Right? And those of them that have a bunch of experiments ready to move on will be better placed. So it's not actually about committing huge resources. It's about having a set of options very deliberately ready for the moment when the market starts to turn. You're like, well, OK, let's go find some areas of growth because there'll be opportunity. So it may not be about committing huge resources. It's about being this sort of deliberate set of experiments ready to go as the market turns. Yep, no, we definitely see that often with our clients and our partners. Um, well, that kind of wraps it up on our end. Um, once again, my name is Thomas Brady, uh, news business lead with Bundle. Uh, we had the pleasure of talking with Andy here today. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much for chatting with us. And before we sign off, I'd like to give you the opportunity for you to share with our audience, you know, what are you working on? Where can they actually get the book? And tell us where we can find you. And if you want to shout out anything else, please feel free. Yeah, find me on LinkedIn, uh, Andrew J.M. Bins, uh, and by all means, go buy the book at at, uh, at Amazon or your local bookstore, even more, um, uh, Corporate Explorer, uh, uh, um, and, and I'd love feedback. I, I, I love hearing from people who've read the book and how it reflects you know, their experience and um, certainly challenging any of the thoughts um, that I've shared today. So thank you very much for the uh, opportunity, the invitation to speak with you and your and your, and your listeners. Yeah, it was absolutely a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I hope to talk with you soon and I uh, wish you the best of luck.